They call them seven neural arts and sciences. I call them the seven sacred sciences, same difference, which is basically astronomy, geometry, arithmetic, music, rhetoric, grammar, and logic, or reasoning. This is a, I guess you can, oh yeah, it's a metaphysical or esoteric approach <clears throat> because ancient civilization, those who guided ancient civilization, those that were the leaders of ancient civilizations were initiates. And, and that meant that they had went through a process of initiation anywhere from probably 25 to 40 years of study to rise to the higher levels. So when they wear the crown or the reds on their forehead, it indicates that they have been initiated and that their higher consciousness had become illumined or opened, the third eye, the spiritual sight, had become awakened. And they now were actually kings or divine people existing on earth. This is an earlier time. So all those that were the judges, the administrators, the navigators, the engineers, the kings, the all of these individuals to become, to be knowledgeable and learned. The only way you could become knowledgeable and learned is that you had to go through the university system. And the university system was united with spirituality, uh, was united with the hard sciences. It was one, it wasn't separated. Like now you can become a physicist and you don't have no kind of spiritual or moral code. You can build bombs and blow people up and don't even you ain't worried about it, just doing your job <clears throat> or whatever. In terms of in the ancient times, you didn't only learn about the what, you learned about the why. So what we're trying to bring back is the cosmic why to all of this. Also trying to introduce you to the material where you can, if you are so moved, can refer to that material yourself <clears throat> because the foundation of ancient civilization was based upon knowledge and the uh, major libraries. Those libraries were destroyed and the information scattered. And so what one of the attempts is for in this, this time, we have to regather this information uh, and not have it outside of ourselves. You should have it in your own home. Your own home should be your own library. Uh, so if the people have the knowledge themselves, then it cannot be destroyed by destroying an outside institution. <coughs> but then the, set, the higher level than that all this knowledge is already resident within your own mind. And through developing reflective, contemplated uh, living, one can start to access this information. But if you don't, if your mind hasn't been trained properly, you won't even recognize the information because you won't have a reference point to even understand what you are contacting. And we're contacting this stuff all the time. Most people don't give any value because they've been conditioned not to give it value because they think it's fantasy, illusion, daydreams, or whatever. And so what we're trying to, to bring people back into an awareness of is that these things are real, that everything that happens in your life has a purpose to it if you were to look at it in the inside as opposed to the outside. So, uh, we started off, uh, really last we kind of did a, some general conditioning, but I had some handouts here on the problem of the unity of the psyche and matter. How many people don't have this hand up? From last week. Yeah. From a book called Number and Time by Marie Louise von Franz. She was, she is a analytical psychologist from the Jungian school. And uh, just before Carl Jung, I don't know if you're familiar with Carl Jung, but it's called Number in time. What's the last name? Uh, von Franz. V-O-N-F-R-A-N-Z. She wrote a number of good books. Another good, really good book she wrote on was called uh, Alchemy. Marie. Marie Louise von Franz. Number and time. And time. Yeah, it's on the list. Oh, okay, let me pass the list on. Uh, this is also a, the rest is reference material. Okay, my, I guess give me some, give people who knew some background of who I am. Okay. 
uh, I guess I'm a student of Black Gnostic Studies at Crane Spiritual Center. Uh, for those who are not familiar, Dr. and Mrs. Lagan, uh, who were the founders of the Aquarian Bookshop, are also metaphysicians and uh, have a course of study or a school of study called Black Gnostic Studies, where Dr. Lagan has, his work has been to reassemble the fragmented knowledge that was fragmented and scattered to the four corners of the globe at the fall of the African civilization, which really commenced at the beginning of the Piscean Age. For those who are not familiar with the Piscean Age, you know, the Great Ages, it's a great year of 26,000 years. It takes the solar system to travel in its orbit. So every approximately 2,160 years, it's another age. We're presently at the, really at the final stage of the Piscean Age, Age of Pisces represented by the fish. So the whole Christian people riding around with fishes on their car, talking about astrology as demonic, or going around with an astrological symbol on their car. They don't really understand the true basis of even the religion that they're professing their own selves, which is, we can get into. <laughs> but anyway, at the, begin, at the end of the Aryan age and the beginning of the Piscean age, when the Christians came in and started to destroy a lot of the metaphysical schools of thought, uh, that the information became housed in different pieces in different cultures around the globe. Different cultures kind of took parts of the whole knowledge and built up and focused on one aspect of it, be it just meditation or yoga or practice of alchemy or it can be the various interpretation of words, symbol, music, vibration, etc. <clears throat> anyway, the, if you read, basically Stolen Legacy, if you really read Stolen Legacy and look in terms of the 42 books of Hermes, they outline the curriculum of the initiates that went through the ancient universities of Africa. And so uh, the Aquarian Spiritual Center's work was to pull back or to regather together the curriculum, the information and knowledge that was resident in those universities at the fall. And so the idea is if the beginning of the fall came with the destruction of the mystery schools, <coughs> then the ascent will then commence with the reopening of the mystery schools. Because the mystery schools was the foundation for the education of those who brought civilization and high culture to the world. So thusly, if we do no longer have those that have this knowledge, we will not be able to recreate those kinds of civilizations and we'll constantly get these short-term solutions. And so based upon that, there's a curriculum of study that basically lasts 20 years. When you go to the total cycle of the knowledge, it takes 20 years. Those 20 years provide you what they call the lesser mysteries, which is the training and the conditioning to prepare you to become self-directed. Where then you can travel in distant land and foreign countries, basically talking about going into different states of consciousness, into different subject matters, and be able to then interpret and understand which you encounter. And so that then is the solar mystery. The solar mysteries is the individual journey that each of us has to take. No one can really transform you. You have to transform yourself. And unless you transform yourself, you're not really transformed because you're dependent on something outside of yourself. So the ultimate goal is to condition one's heart through the virtues and their mind through the liberal arts and sciences to become an independent, true human, free and uh, duly uh, prepared. And so uh, that's the point. So anyway, the information that is the given <coughs> is esoteric. Esoteric meaning the inner knowledge and not the outer. The general education you get at the uni universities is what we call exoteric or outer information. Uh, that is not, that's only half of the picture. <clears throat> the true basis of knowledge is inner knowledge or esoteric or metaphysical knowledge. <clears throat> An ancient civilization was based upon making metaphysical knowledge the foundation for the operation of civilization and culture. So, uh, so coming out of that, uh, my job uh, is to then introduce uh, those who so desire or interested into this information. And the first stroke is a wide stroke in terms of introducing people to a broad range of information <clears throat> with the understanding 
and each of us has a mission in life. Each of us was called here to do specific work and have specific skills and capacities. And that as you're introduced to various things or go along your path in life, you become attracted to certain things. And it's not by circumstance. It's like it has a meaning there when you're attracted to something. And the idea is for them to follow that. And that will become the lead to lead you along your path in terms of fulfillment of your particular work. And so <clears throat> the idea is, is to give you broad introduction to a broad uh, field of knowledge and then what attracts you, you should follow that and go deeper into that particular area of information. And so, uh, and also a part of it is just to introduce people and make them aware of this information that's there. So that if you're so moved, you can follow up on that information and have the, the, the direct source yourself. So, uh, otherwise it would take us two or three years to just go through each of these courses that we're really going to go through this. And now I do refer to all this and try to bring a lot of that to the class, but the class doesn't have the time, and most people don't have to make the commitment to sacrifice to do that. But then I make it available, so you have it. Uh, ultimately, the idea is for individuals to start to develop their own libraries, for these libraries are within our homes. Because when the libraries are within our homes, that means our family and our kids also to get exposed to it and it becomes a natural part of our life as opposed to something separate like we go over here to study or we go to these universities to study as opposed to we should be going into our own homes and studying and doing research. So this is a part of the new age of Aquarius where the key word is I know and knowledge becomes the base for the next 22,000 years plus. So that's kind of a general overview. I did go through the 20 year course uh, of study and uh, it just prepared me to really begin to study. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, in the course of your conversation, uh, you touched on uh, astrophysics, and leaving the body, mm -hmm. but this seemed to be uh, rampant in uh, the now. Mm -hmm. People were leaving their body. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also, you said that you become aware of things if you tune into it. Right. See, a lot of people don't tell me you're not saying that they're leaving their body. Mm -hmm. So they're leaving their body without really knowing why they're leaving their body. Right. When we can learn how to leave our body, we control that. Right, consciously. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. And that's the key word, is to become consciously able to operate in the world, where most people are operating unconsciously. That's really what the whole purpose is, is to become conscious. And, uh, and really become conscious of who we really are as really divine beings in the material, only using what, four or five percent of our mental capacity. So, uh, and these studies, the, the art, liberal arts and sciences condition the mind to understand how the divine intelligence operates. And then once you understand how the divine intelligence operates, then you can become a conscious co-creator in helping to move the master plan, the divine plan forward toward fulfillment as opposed to working against it and retarding the evolution of the human race. And the initiation was all about accelerating the evolutionary process because everybody, I think, uh, I was going to say, uh, you know, I'm reflecting on, I go to a lot of places, so I was going to say, I was reflecting on how uh, Jimmy Hendricks had said anybody could be a Christ because the Christ is the Christ principle. It's not a personality. It's a level of consciousness. And if one is willing to subjugate themselves to the disciplines, they can evolve their consciousness at the same level. So all those that came before us and exemplified high states of consciousness were really forerunners or previews of where the whole human race eventually must uh, attain to. So, I can talk more on that. But, and also, we call ourselves Gnostics. Gnostic is a Greek term that deals with gnosis or knowledge or knowing. Black, from the ancient, understand that black relates to wisdom. Because wisdom is something that is there but not seen. So just like if you cut the lights off in this room, we all would still be in this room, but we couldn't see each other. So if you are unconscious, you would think nothing is here. 
But if you are conscious of what's really going on, you would know that there are chairs and tables and people sitting all around you. And that's the way wisdom is. Wisdom appears to be nothing there. But if you can look deep inside of it, it's a wealth that is there. And life is like that. Everything we need is right here with us. But because we are not conscious of it, we don't think or know it's here. And so black dealt with the issue of wisdom and of course study. So the and what we look at is the universality of all knowledge. Because all knowledge, all religions are based upon the one. Because there's only one universal truth. <coughs> and so for humans, you just talking about the brothers and sisters in Liberia now have tribalism fighting each other over pettiness. That's because the level of consciousness has been focused on the Western view of externals. To where if we can get our consciousness back to understanding the greater purpose of life, we wouldn't be affected by these little petty things because we know it's bullshit. It wouldn't even affect us. And when we, in, when we respond to and operate off of that, it really lets us know where our consciousness really is. And so uh, that's really what the greater point is of this, is to try to move us beyond the petty into that which is universal. Um, so, anything else? It's a general overview. Uh, and it, especially for African people, because this, although it may come in many forms externally, you know, like you say, okay, this is a, a European woman. Uh, but the subject matter that she's talking about is coming out of ancient sources. Because if you study Carl Jung's work, <coughs> he really came into his own is when he went back to Africa and he had an experience with African shamans in terms of how they dealt with psychology and how they dealt with the, with the spirit world. And he had also had many uh, experiences with spiritualists as he grew up. So he knew there was more to life and just the Freudian view. <clears throat> and, uh, but when he went there, he actually went back into what he said, his own blackness. In terms, he accepted the origin of coming out of Africa and coming out of blackness. And then from that, it enabled him to tap into a lot of other, uh, what I would say, levels of understanding. <clears throat> and, but I said to say that African people are seed people. And we really are the missing link, the keystone, that is keeping the world from getting back in true harmony with itself. And so only by us getting back in harmony with our own original thinking will we then be able to put the world back into harmony with its original way of being, because we are that seed. And so um, it's also kind of a... a uh, well, I don't want to put it, make it too heavy on, although it is heavy in terms of a divine mission that we really have. We are really, the, we are really the solution to the problem. And so, to the degree that we are not together, will be to the degree that the world is not together. And to the degree that we are together, really, the African Americans are the key, because we are transcontinental. But again, we don't look at ourselves this way, so we are not taking responsibility for who we really are, just like the issue in Liberia. If we were aware of who we are, we could go over there and, and, and just cool that right out. But because we're so ignorant, again, you know, we sit and pass, we watch things as opposed to us really understanding who we are and applying who we are effectively in the world. But anyway, I'm, that's not the basis of this presentation. <coughs> but it's connected. Because sometimes we'll get into some deep things, some of it will be very possibly confusing or uh, uh, new and uh, different, right. And uh, that's okay. So anyway, so the two, I say two books is The Sacred Science of Numbers by Helene Kareem and uh, Serpent in the Sky by John Webb. Here, this is, I would say this Serpent in the Sky is a classic piece. If you're interested in understanding the, what they call pharaonic consciousness or the consciousness of the pharaoh or the great African kings, this is what he's talking about. What was the mindset and the philosophy that governed their thinking that was able us to create those civilizations? And so, okay. 
I got into, I'm um, getting brought in number and time because she's talking about how quantum physics is reflecting metaphysics. Because if you go deep enough in any direction, you're going to come to the same thing be it through the journey of the material way or through the journey of the metaphysical way because the source is the same. And so, <clears throat> so physics is actually starting to move into metaphysics. But it also makes a connection between the relationship between the psyche and matter that there's a unified field that is not a disconnection between the psyche and the mind and the material world. It's just an extension of the same thing. And then the role that number plays in the ordering of the physical world, also then the role that number plays in terms of the psychic world. And so the whole basic purpose is to get us to understand the basic concepts so then as you encounter these things in your life, you can decipher what's really going on. So, so in that light, I want to review uh, the problem of unity of the psyche and matter. So that leads us into uh, talk a little bit about symbolism, and uh, then we're going to get into a little bit about the zero. That'll probably be the end of the night. The next week we'll talk about the next session because I won't be here next Thursday, but the following Thursday, and then we'll deal with uh, one and the two. I won't be here next Thursday. Next Thursday. Right. The other thing we're saying, that you, they go hand in hand. Esoteric and exoteric are the both sides of the whole. So you have to do both to really get the whole thing. Uh, my particular focus, although I do teach exoteric history and things also, but this particular focus is esoteric. In chapter one, I will review a couple of key points in the handout. Uh, starting on page three, it says, and we're in your hand out the first page. In recent years, the question of the relation of psyche and matter has come more and more to the forefront of scientific discussion, although we still have to admit that we are dealing with an unfathomable mystery. <clears throat> also, as we do this study, certain key words will, be, uh, will consistently show up. This is what I call the golden thread because that reoccurring idea that keeps popping up really is directing you toward the point. So if you learn to like kind of clue into those reoccurring themes, it will enable you to understand what is the real point. What is the thing that's connecting all these things together? Now I was saying that because it said that they're dealing here with the connection between the psyche and matter, but they're ultimately dealing with the unfathomable mystery. So there's something here that can't, you can't get to the bottom of it. And so last session we talked about Memphite theology. For those that wasn't here last week, uh, we reviewed the Memphite theology that is in Stolen Legacy. And Memph if you are not familiar with, you should definitely review Memphite theology and understand that initial creation story. <clears throat> because although it is a story, it is actually uh, scientific formula that is now being actually verified through quantum physics. The same concepts and ideas that are unfolded and talking about the new being unlimitable, boundless, concealed, a great mystery out of which came Pata and uh, simultaneously from Pata the one there was a simultaneously there was a creation of Atum and then from Atum, Atum named the parts of himself which were pairs, male and female, positive and negative, and those eight, four pairs, which equal eight, then were the basis of creation. And so eight plus Atum made nine, which was the Enad, or the nine digits that make up all the numbering systems. And if you add Pata to Atum, you get 10. And so again, they look at that and say, oh, that's fantasy and, and myths. 
But if you can look at the inside, you can see the universal truth that is being talked about there. So I'm saying review Memphite theology because it's going to keep coming up over and over again. And you haven't kind of put it to a basic memory when certain ideas come up in the literature, it's not going to ring a bell. You're going to miss it. Well, basic elements, just quick, and I'll miss the mm -hmm. uh, In terms of Memphite theology? Yes, yeah, there were two, the four elements on the page. Male and female. It gets to that, but basically it's before that. It's actually dealing with uh, what? Shoe and Tef nut. You had uh, Gib and Seb. Then you had Isis, Osiris, uh, Seth, and Nephthys. Are they representative of the they, They're representing out of the four elements. They're before the four elements. They really represent cosmic, higher cosmic function. And then those cosmic functions then start to manifest because that's pre-creation. That is like the, the gods are before the material world as we know it came into being. Those are the principles behind the material world. Right. right. So then the medium through which the material world came into being was the four elements. Fire, earth, and water, which interact with the three qualities cardinal, fixed, and mutable, or action, reaction, and synthesis, or uh, creating, preserving, and destroying. That's the trinity. Creating, preserving, and destroying, or transforming, because destroying is actually transforming. So those, that's the trinity. So every time they talk about trinity, they're really talking about the three qualities of, of creation, creating, preserving, and transforming. We perceive transforming as being destruction because we're tied to the physical. It's just like when something dies, it goes back to the earth, it's not dead, it transforms into something else. Yeah. Right, because then it can't be created or destroyed and changed in form. Okay. So then, those three qualities interact with the four, fire, air, earth, and water, that create all things. And which really represents three plus four is seven. And three times four is twelve. So you have the twelve signs of the zodiac. So the twelve in my father's house there are many mansions. All these things are really talking about these principles. <laughs> <laughs> it's a re eureka. Beep. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So. so back to that, what I got into that was talking about Memphite theology because it's critical because so you it's, it's so much will come to your understanding if you have that basic story in your mind as we start to go over these concepts. You just see how it just it fits, you know. And then you'll be able to relate that to the creation story in the Bible. You see where that comes from. You know, if you really want to get into the foundation of the Bible, uh, you really need to get into the Kabbalah. Uh, it's, uh, I hope it's on the reference list. If it's not, it will be next week. But I have a whole other series of books. Uh, that I'm going to add to the next list for next week. Yeah, so it's a whole other series of books that I add to the list for next week. Uh, but yeah, it gets into uh, the whole foundation that the Christian mythology is really based upon. And then the Kabbalah in this writing comes out of Kemet, um, because, you know, the so-called uh, Jews or Hebrews, you know, actually were Africans that moved out of the Nile to start really the Aryan age. When the Aryan age, they came, they took the knowledge that really, and the, this, well, I'm getting off, but the story of Moses related that he was a priest of Agnaten. And at the fall of Agnaten, when the, the, the old order came back into power, then Moses moved out so that he could take the whole concept of the monotheism to a new place to start to generate that understanding because it couldn't be done in the old place. And so, uh, which then means that whole Hebrew tradition is really just an extension of that school of thought that came out of the, of the of, of Kemet. But now back to this. Mm -hmm. And the reason I kind of got there when I said unfathomable mystery, immediately I went to the noon. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but then if you understand the nature of the noon, then you have more information than what they're talking about. Because in the noon, there were also four pairs of deities or energies in the noon. So 
So it talks about how everything is a reflection. It's always duality. So that which was in non-being is reflected in being. Or that which is in non-manifestation is reflected in manifestation. So manifestation or existence is a reflection of pre-existence. Now I guess in the final note that we are constantly bring up, it was saying that in the beginning there was chaos. But then chaos was defined as pre-creation. Which then means that we're finding ourselves now in chaotic time. In reality, we find ourselves in pre-creation time. Because for something new to be created, the old has to be put into a state of disorder before it can be reordered. Right. But chaos is only seemingly chaotic on the outside because in the inside of it, there is order. And so the whole purpose is to get us to look inside as opposed to outside. So, so it said that, uh, talking about moving into an impenetrable realm of nature. Along with the discoveries in modern physics, the most important discovery made at the beginning of the century was undoubtedly that of the unconscious. Empirical proof was adduced that our personality consists not only of an ego-centered field of consciousness, so your ego is that part of your consciousness, that you are the awareness field of consciousness, but also of an immeasurable, key word, immeasurable. Now in the other paragraph, we talked about unfathomable. So now we're in immeasurable, wide realm of unconscious psychic activity. So this is saying that, there, that our psyche consists of a level of the ego that just deals with our consciousness side and then we have an unconscious side that is immeasurable but within that immeasurable dimension there is psychic activity going on so now now you need to also relate that immeasurable to the noon so that if you understand the nature of the noon you also understand the nature of your own unconscious mind and then if you understand the process of, of becoming conscious or aware, because to name something, you have to identify it or be conscious of it. So then creation actually is the process of identifying something and giving it a name. Originally, giving it a name actually means you're able to define it. Which means if you can't define something, you can't build, you can't, can't come into reality. Which we have a lot of implications even for African American people because we have a major problem with identity. So if we are not clear on our identity, then there's no way we're going to be able to re reproduce ourselves or to create. So then by keeping us in a state of confusion, they keep us in a state of chaos, and we can never create our own. Because what they do is take that energy and use and direct us into their thing and then we create for them. Right. Oh, what I'm trying to flip-flop is show how, I try to show how this metaphysics is not something outside of ourselves. It's something, if we look at it in a certain way, can be used to solve the problem that we live in every day. The same thing about each and every one of us. If you don't have, an, have, a, if you don't have a clear identity of yourself, you can't be creative. Or if you have a warped understand of yourself that becomes the base of your creation because people can create very negatively based upon how they identify themselves and identity is related to any beginning of any cycle is identity so the question comes who are you do you really know who you are so back to this it says through dreams and this is a critical point through dreams visions spontaneous fantasies, faulty actions, involuntary gestures, physical symptoms, and other factors, we are able to obtain a certain degree of indirect information about this realm of the psyche. So it's giving you here clues, not yet, 
on how you can gain information about this immeasurable dimension within your own self. So the question is, do you record your dreams or are you aware of your dreams? Do you, I think the last, did you get one last week? Do you take your vision seriously? Or you think just some fan something well, I can't I want to get the fancy yet. Do you take your dream your vision seriously? Spontaneous fantasies when certain things come to your mind. Where is that coming from? You just think something popped in your head? Nothing happens by chance. Everything has meaning. The question is, can you uncover the meaning of it? Or do you even recognize that it has meaning? Because if you don't recognize it has meaning, you're not gonna to try to find meaning there. Faulty action. So even things that you do that are not correct is also giving you insights in terms of your inner self. Almost like, like Freudian slips. You know, even though you said something that's so-called was incorrect, you said it for a reason. Now why did you say that? It's connected to something. Involuntary gestures. So even body movements can give indications of the inner life. That's why in, in, in Africa, <coughs> drummers can sit and watch people dance and say what their problems are in terms of how they move. They can identify what type of work you do by the way you move because a different profession has certain coordinated movements that's related to that profession and those movements will come out in the way you dance. And so, and physical symptoms. Now understand the mind-body connection. And so your body is reflecting your psychic reality. So if you have certain physical symptoms, certain aches and pains or diseases, it's really a reflection of your thinking. Because people talk about you, you make me sick to my stomach. You keep saying that, you end up with ulcers or some other kind of problem. Or you just have a pain in my neck. You know, you have to watch things that you say because energy follows thought. And you then create your own reality. Right. So anyway, it says here that Jung discovered that while a sector of this unconscious region is indeed personal and consists of personal complexes, and what he's talking about here, your unconscious mind, and the reason why I get into it, the unconscious is because Symbols and all these things we're talking about are directly related to our state of consciousness. But basically the image of the consciousness is a circle. And then conscious mind is basically one fourth of the total psyche. And then on the conscious mind, you have four on the conscious mind, you have the ego. Then you have, and these things are not proportional, then you have the personal unconscious. Then you have the collective unconscious. This is your, uh, what they call your persona, or the mask that we, each of us have a mask that we use to operate in the world, you know, because and this is the outer environment. <clears throat> so when you're a child or a baby, and you're still natural, your person, your, your ego tries to express itself. But your outer environment, which is your family and your home or whatever, responds to you. And I'll give the example, say, uh, if you're a little guy or and you're a baby and you like, you got your really energetic, so you're in your crib. You get bouncing around. You like to, you know, you might be an athlete or a gymnast or whatever. That's like your natural nature. But then your parents come in and grab you. Don't do that. You know, stop doing that. Stop doing that. So every time you start bouncing, somebody grabs you and says, stop doing that. So that's like a negative response, power law, right? A negative conditioning. So after a while, when you get ready to jump, that's in the jump, the response gonna come to your mind, you're gonna hold yourself back. Or maybe you had artistic talent, you was in your crib painting on the wall or something. 
And he said, boy, don't be bitten at all. And he smacked your hand. As a police committee, they should have covered your wall with a canvas and let you paint on that wall, you know, or whatever, directly. But so now every time you go to grab or paint, the pain or the shouting in your ear makes you hold back. So that's like negativity. So all those negatives, you then push down into your unconscious mind. You start trying not to operate from that. So what happens is that's your first thing unconscious. So if you're a black person, they all come and tell you that black is negative, that black is bad, then you're going to push that down, so that's like a negative. So your personal unconscious is made up of all those negative or suppressed things that life has put on you, that now you bury them down in your unconscious mind, because you can't operate from that. You might, I want to be an artist, but I can't be it. I might want to write or be a science or aviator, whatever those things may be. So then... Uh, your persona then starts to, you create a persona to where you might be bouncing your crib, but when you hear your mama coming, you stop. So you start to create a mask that is acceptable to the outer environment because that's the way you can survive and don't do pain. And so then, uh, so that's your persona. This is your ego. Your ego is the conscious part of you that wants to stay in control. And then the collective unconscious, you have what they call the true self, is down in the collective unconscious. And then they have a thing called the anima and the animus. And the anima, if for a male, his ego is masculine, but his inner self is opposite. So that for a man, his outer self would be masculine, but his inner self would be feminine. And for a woman, her outer persona is feminine, but her inner self is masculine in terms of <coughs> energy. So for a man, his inner self is called an animal, and for a woman, it's the animal. And this is kind of like the guide, the inner guide, that can get you in contact with yourself. Anyway, I'm kind of getting to a whole thing. The point is, he made a comment about this personal unconscious. The personal unconscious really represents all the psychic residues that we accumulate in living. Whatever those things may be you in school, and people talk about you'll never imagine like you can't do this and that, or you know, you out, you know, you're overweight or underweight, people talking about you. That stuff you try to suppress. All that goes in here. So when things come from yourself, which is inside your unconscious mind, and the, and the self communicates through symbolism, dreams, visions, fantasy, intuitional things. When that information tries to reach your conscious mind, it has to go through the personal unconscious. So when it goes through the personal unconscious, it can get perverted because of energy. And so then, also the ego, however the ego has been conditioned to be successful in life, when the unconscious mind tries to communicate with it, if it hasn't been conditioned to understand what's going on, it sees the unconscious mind trying to disturb it, like a disturbance, and it tries to suppress it. And I, oh, I give the analogy, if you've ever been out to the ocean at night and walk out to the edge of the ocean and just stand there when nobody else is around you and just feel the pull of the ocean on you, if you just get into it, it'll feel like this, this, this overwhelming force is there. That's the same way the ego feels when the unconscious mind is trying to communicate with it. There's a feeling that I'm going to die or something's going to take me over. That's why when people get into a state where the unconscious is trying to communicate with them, many times it generates fear because they don't know what's going on. But what, what the, how the ego takes it is something that's trying to take me over, or something that's trying to protect me, or something that's trying to envelop me, or that I'm going to die. And in one sense, it is a death, but death is what? Transformation. Well, because we haven't been conditioned to understand that, we resist it, we suppress it, or we get tighter. And that's what's happening with the Europeans now. Because their persona, the way they have adapted the world, has to change. But and they feel this change coming. Except and, and extend, instead of accepting it, they're trying to hold on to what was the old way. And so then anything that tries to come up and, and represent a change is going to try to cut it down or destroy it. Because then it creates a threat. It also helps to happen in our personal life. When something comes into our personal life, it disrupts the 
way we become comfortable, many times we then try to suppress that thing or control that thing or destroy that thing. Because if we let it be, we have a sense that it's going to destroy us. So anyway, the key thing though, and this represents hell, the person on top is all that negative stuff you want to suppress. So that so for one to go down and discover self, they gotta go through hell. That's where all the demons lie, you know, all those fears and anxieties and phobias and things that you suppress is in here. That's why one has to go back and really review their life and understand where this stuff comes from. So anyway, I just kind of give you a, uh, uh, and down here, I'll tell you one more point. Down here they have what they call archetypes, you know, like the uh, father archetype, the mother archetype, uh, the partner archetype, the savior, the hero, the heroine. These are all energies that reside in the unconscious mind. The way you give expression to these things is by projecting them to the, in the outside world. So usually like like the feminine and the masculine are down there. So usually for, um, I'm saying to say that these various complexes can have both a positive and a negative. Like the mother principle can be tender and loving, but also can be the terrible mother. And everything has polarity. Uh, so what I was talking about. I was talking about that because I was getting the complex. So what happens in your personal unconscious? If certain types of behaviors or constantly suppressed, they, they gather together. Because light, you know, gathers together. You get a whole lot of the or respond to you. But usually when things would upset you or throw you off, it's not outside, it's that outside thing is contacting something in your own unconscious mind. That's upsetting you. Because the behavior or whatever it is, is a projection, because everything is self. And so really it gives you an indication of something that you need to deal with. Because ideally, you know, we're supposed to be able to maintain balance and harmony. I mean, that's the ultimate, you know, reality. And so when things throw you off, then they give you an indication of something inside of you that's unresolved that needs to be related to. And, uh, what else I want to say? Something else that on the, and everything that's negative is also on the positive. You're, uh, a woman's, the way a woman relates to masculinity, she usually projects onto men that act that out. And the way a man relates to femininity, he projects on the female that act those characteristics out. And then by interacting with them, you're able to experience that within your own self. But then if you have some complexes in here, because the way the mother and the father is defined in your conscious mind is the way you interacted with the mother and the father in your life. That's why parenting is so important because the relationship that you have with your parents condition the way you relate to the psychological functions. So what you're saying is like uh, trying to understand and, uh, somebody that uh, personality that you keep saying and dating, somebody that you keep dating right. over and over and over again. Of the same type. Of the person. same type. Right. So you're saying if I, if I really dislike her uh, uh, or the females I'm meeting I really dislike her or her organization mm -hmm. then that's something in myself that I have a problem with right so the other question is why are you constantly being attracted to them why it is something in here you're not resolving yourself it's constantly attracting you to that mm -hmm. if it's not working out So the issue is, is well, what is, because the key thing with every relationship and everything, what's the meaning of it? It's not the external activities, it's what does it mean? Like we have an accident, you say, I'm not going to never go across that intersection, I'm, some people, I'm never going to drive again. It's not the external activity, it's what does it mean? What does it mean? What is the significance of that? It has a significance to it if you think about it deeply.
So every time you engage in this, what is it trying to tell you? But everything trying to tell you something, trying to help you to grow, help you to learn, help you to see yourself better. But anyway, it's kind of horrible. So looking at that child, right. and that is what happened when a person is uh, being looking at guys, let's say guys on psychology, guys on psychology, Everything you do is registered. And it's in your memory, but because the way how our ego functions and comfortable, uncomfortable things, it won't bring it up. Because it don't want to address it or whatever the reasons may be. And so yeah, so what happens is it suppresses that control so that you're able to access, you know. Because you know like, we have the capacity to have over that memory, you know, because everything is there. <coughs> well anyway, I got into this because they were talking about this level of the personal uh, uh, complex, which is that personal unconscious. And uh, all those things about the devil and sin and negativity and hate, that stuff is in the personal unconscious because that's stuff that society puts on you as a negative. You know, so you're a little kid and you have a little friend and then they come up and say, oh, you can't play with them because of whatever. And that, that naturally to play and to relate is a natural part of life. So then for another force outside of you to come in and to, to, to break that up and to give you some kind of whatever reason why, that then creates a negative that you have to then suppress your natural tendency to want to go out and maybe talk to somebody or relate to somebody or play to somebody or whatever. So every time you cut off those natural reactions, it creates a complex. Well, really, it doesn't create a complex till you build up enough of that suppressed energy to where it becomes a complex. And once you constellate that, constellation means all this stuff gathers together, then people can become obsessed or possessed because the energy starts to take over. And then you, you can have, it can, that complex can actually come up and take over your ego and start to operate and control you. That's why some people can just take, you know, certain things can happen and trigger something, they're not even in control because it's, it's all this suppressed energy takes over and starts to operate and control their ego. When it gets, becomes highly, you know, right, fragmented, yeah, it becomes schizophrenic. You can have multiple personalities. Because people go in and different parts of themselves that are fragmented come out at certain times to help uh, relieve the, the personality of other pressures that's run away from. But I want to get into this heavy this psychological thing, but it's it's all a part of it because number is, is again, related to how the nature is ordered and how the psyche functions. Because numbers of things, you're dreaming, you dream, dream about two things or five things that has significance. Why was it five? Why was it two? You know, and usually in dreams, uh, when you dream of the opposite sex, you're really dreaming about the other side of you, your inner side. Yes. Mm -hmm. the, the thing is, you have to look at the dream. What was uh, what was the other thing that was happening in the dream? See, there was the dream is a story. Usually, what happened with a dream and we went off. <laughs> what I What happened in the dream is. First of all, dreams are not singular. You just, they said if you keep a record of all your dreams, all those dreams are a piece of a whole puzzle that gives you information, okay, about the whole. They're not just disconnected. <coughs> then what goes on in the dream? Because dreams operate in terms of uh, uh, like a story form, and then you might the scene a change. You know, you, you know, sometimes you'll be in this, next thing you know, you're in a totally different scene. But it's related to the other thing. But the other side of it is, is what else was happening in the dream? Were there people in the dream? What was going on? That, that gives you insight in terms of what it's kind of talking about. The other thing is, is when you sit down and think about the dream, and just think about it, what do you think it means? 
Because see, sometimes if you just let your own intuitive mind not let your ego come in and say, you want to make it something? But you say, okay, what does it really mean to me? What does it, what does it mean to you? <coughs> so, okay. But if we got into more details... <laughs> right. But you, and so in the dream, you wasn't graduating? No, exactly. And so it's a reoccurring dream? Yeah, I think Another thing is you need to look at the time you was dreaming. What was going on in your life when this dream came? You know, so all that stuff gives you information on what the dream really means. So you're saying that when you dream about a woman, mm -hmm. you dream about yourself. Yeah, all the aspects of yourself, yeah. <laughs> That's great. What would you have a problem with uh, Homosexual? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So see again, it's not it's not this that cut and dry. It's all in the context of what the dream is talking about. You gotta take the whole thing in. Because see, essentially the, the, the psyche is is seeking to become whole. And see, we are acting out in the outer world really a psychic drama. So in other words, we, we, in other words, we are at one time uh, we were uh, androgynous. Well, that's, yeah. Not in the physical. But in, but in, but in the mental. Yeah. Uh, right. Okay. We still are. We just haven't come to uh, operate from that unity. That's part of the problem, you know, that in this society, that creates a lot of problems in society is because this society says either you're either this or you're either that. So if I can only be this, but yet I have uh, feminine characteristics in me, then it doesn't match with the outer world. So then if, my, if the persona says if I'm a male, I'm supposed to be macho, blah, 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 but, it, but I don't feel that way, and the society says if you're not this, then you're this then what choice do I have? If this doesn't fit me, then I must be this over here. So the, the society actually creates, pigeonholes people with, with very few options. Where in traditional society, there were things men could, there were various rituals and ceremonies where men played out being a woman, or where women played out being a man. And then, so that you could release that kind of energy in yourself. You said that it's not in the physical, I recently read a, a, a Good health um, where he talked about at one time possibly even being in the physical, like being out of uh, uh, And then your prostate, how it relates to, to a woman's view, is that almost a sign of a prostate is going to be That's so because. Even in, a, even in a physical sense, maybe the possibility at one time. And he was talking about uh, a spiritual or uh, mental being both in the physical. Well, my understanding is because of the, the physical body, you know, every, everything, I think, isn't everything fem female until a certain time? And then it converts over in terms of male, in terms of embryo. Yeah. So the basic prototype of the human organism is a female. Okay. And then only at a certain developmental stage does it branch off and becomes a, a male. It really is telling us something, too about females. <laughs> I can get into a story about really what the role of men are even in the world. <laughs> uh, it's protective provide for females because females are the real source. If you go back in culture, that's the way culture came. It came with a female. Female was the foundation of these of manifested the creation, the manifested world is based upon the female as the form the form giver. You know, in, in family and in civilization, if you go back, and the male basically was the energy that impregnated and then protected. But the, the, the main substance is the female. And even in the psychic world, in the spiritual world, it's tapping into the feminine energy, the receptive energy, that one is able to really access their greater creative capacity. You can't force creativity. You have to be receptive to creativity. 
You know, you got to be relaxed or listen or let it come in. You can't make it come in. You see, all those are feminine qualities. Now, we equate femininity with being a woman and not with a principle, which then creates confusion in people's minds or, you know, and in their egos. But anyway, we have a tendency to do this a lot. <laughs> I was reviewing some of the tapes that were supposed to be on one subject and <laughs> we're on all kinds of other stuff. So, it says that uh, while this section of the unconscious region is indeed personal and consists of personal complexes, a further portion is universally human and appears to have the same structure in every individual. Young called this layer of the unconscious which manifests itself similarly in all mankind, the collective unconscious. This layer does not represent merely a psychic appendage of archaic remains, as Sigmund Freud saw, but the living creative matrix of all our unconscious and conscious functions, the essential structural basis of all our psychic life. This goes right back to the moon. The, the living, creative matrix of all our unconscious and conscious functions, the essential structural basis of our basic psychic life. And he says, within this basic stratum of our psychic psyche, certain particular forms may be rel relatively isolated, which in a manner comparable to the behavioral uh, pattern of animals, dynamically and form formally motivate our emotions, imaginings, feelings, and actions. So there is a, a specific strata within our psyche that can be isolated, which is comparable to the behavior in animals, which they're saying is equivalent to instinct, but they're psychic structures that are similar to the instinct in the animal that are the basis for our emotions, our imaginings, our feelings, and our actions. That in the face of death, for instance, or of an encounter with the opposite sex, as well as in all other common human situations, such inner archetypal reactions become activated. They are comparable to the instinct and are similar in all men and women. Again, it's sexist. All those similar as a woman wrote it. Because they appear coupled with typical emotions, their, their effect also includes the physical sphere. It is common knowledge that emotions such as fear, love, enthusiasm, heroic feelings, and so forth produce immediate physiological and chemical reactions, such as trembling, outbreaks of sweating, and accelerated pulse within us. Basing himself on uh, Pierre was at Denae's earlier work, Jung therefore defined the psyche as a spectrum-like field of reality, situated between the infrared pole of materially bodily reaction on the one end and the ultraviolet pole of the archetype at the other. So basically he's equating this with the electromagnetic spectrum. And you know within the electromagnetic spectrum that part of visible light is a very small portion of the total electromagnetic field, which the rest of that field is invisible to the natural senses sight, touch, taste, etc. But they still exist. And up to lately, the Western world does not acknowledge anything outside that small field of the five senses. If you couldn't touch it, taste it, grab hold of it, it wasn't real. When that means that they base their reality on only a small fraction of reality. So then if you build a philosophy and a civilization on only one fraction of the whole, how can that be whole? It's not going to be whole. It's going to be incomplete. Anything that's incomplete is going to be out of harmony with the greater universe which then creates dis-ease. Because dis-ease is that which is out of harmony or disharmony. So anytime we are sick in actuality, our behavior, be it physical, emotional, or mental, is out of harmony with natural law. And the effects or symptoms is trying to give you insight in terms of how to get back into harmony. <coughs> and this society looks at the effect as something that, that people wave with life. They try to then treat the effects. 
or suppress the effect when the effect itself is actually a signal on how to get back into harmony. So if you suppress or deny the effect, you actually are intensifying the, call, the problem that makes it work. So it goes directly in terms of how the system is trying to deal with the effect of the society, be it unemployment, be it drugs or violence or whatever, by trying to lock it up or shuffle it away or border it up or fence it up. They're dealing with effect and not cause. And so all they're going to do is intensify the problem and make it work. And those of us who are sitting here witnessing this and going along with it are participating in it and are going to reap the effect of the intensified effect. Any questions? So if you look at the, uh, the diagram at the bottom, on the one side, on the left side, it has somatic processes or physical, and on the other side, it has archetypes. These archetypes are those images that exist within the unconscious mind. Those are archetypes. We have a number of different types of archetypes. It says the center of our psychic inwardness flies along the spectrum like a ray of light and is drawn sometimes more to the one end and sometimes more to the other. If one is overcome by an instinctive occurrence, then the emphasis of the ego awareness will slide more to the left. So your somatic or physical self is more instinctive. Whereas if one is possessed by an idea, one is more attracted to the right hand archetypal pole. It may, however, be a surmise that Jung himself realized that the two poles partake of one and the same unknown living reality. So they say Pata is the heart and the tongue of the moon, and Pata is in all things. So Pata represents the unity of the unconscious or of the great unknown. But, it, but that is in all things. Yeah. Right. What is it telling you? It tell you a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, well, it says, well, why are you having this problem with your back? Well, you might be listening wrong, you know. Uh, but if it's just not a physical, like it's not directly related to something that you're physically doing incorrect, and you start having back problems, then it's something that's happened psychically that's creating a back problem. Now, I'm not specialized in medical diagnosis from this particular point of view, but you can start following the symptoms. Start looking at this. To I follow this stuff is really simple. We make it more complex. I said that, he said I was talking about his dream. We can try to make it so complicated we miss the point. The point is really very basic. You know, what I want is to say you have a back problem. But what function does the back play? You know. Then it's telling, then what are the symptoms? Is your back stiff? You know, is it what throbbing? You know, what's happening with it? That symptom is also going to be related to a behavior. A behavior is related to a mental attitude. So what's the mental attitude that equates with a particular kind of behavior if you have? We all that all that is related <coughs> to the cause that's stimulated by behavior. The behavior is a function of your thinking, how you behave. So it all goes back to your thinking. And it can get all the way back that you're in the wrong kind of job. You know, that you don't want to be in. So you're not paying attention to how you're you're doing the work because you really don't want to be there. So the issue may be to get into another line of work. Something that you really enjoy, that that, that matches you. You know. It could be that uh you you're feeling that you're being uh what is like somebody's got their <laughs> foot on your back or something, you know, it, it, it just depends. I, you have to get into, you just can't make general definitions. You have to look at each individual case and see what the specifics are 
because it's going to be different in each case. That's why I can't say, well, I had a dream about a snake. What does that mean? It can mean a lot of stuff. You know, because they got, it could be a negative, it could be a positive in terms of what it represents in your life. So you got to start looking at what the snakes mean to you. You know, what time did it happen? What was going on in your life? You know, what does it mean to you? You know, then what was happening in it? You know, what was it doing? Was it just crawling on the ground, flying with wings? You know, what did you see in the water? You know, all that. Right. But if you start following it and just look at the pattern, it's going to unfold something for you. You know, when did your back hurt? Is it a certain time or the month or the year? Seasonal? Is it a certain time during the job that it starts happening? What? Yeah. Right. Okay. So anyway, it's talking about, and I want to try to finish this up here. It says, um, it says, if we are affected by the physical or the so-called material events of the outer world, we call it matter. If we are moved by fantasies, ideas, or feelings from within, we call it the objective psyche or the collective unconscious. Young then concentrated attention on investigating the latter phenomenon and subsequently discovered to his amazement that he had developed thought models and concepts which exhibited an extraordinary correspondence with the models of microphysics. For example, there is a concept of complementarity in physics between particle and wave, and in psychology between conscious and unconscious events. The necessity for taking the unconscious hypothesis of the observer into account when deciphering events, the limitation of only being able to describe the working, what are basically talking about, you know, in terms of and uh, quantum physics says that you cannot, you cannot take away the observer from what is being observed because the presence of the observer impacts the event because you're energy. So then for you to get involved with it impacts what you're observing because you bring something to that. You alter it in certain, a certain way. The same thing in terms of you trying to observe what's happening in your life. You bring a certain bias in terms of how you look at stuff. That's why a lot of times you gotta go get and talk to a third party because that's just in just listening to you talking. Where you just can talk to yourself. But when you talk to yourself, you might be trying to talk yourself out of something or not see what you're saying clearly because you're biased. Where if you go talk to a third person, you're just talking to that person and not trying to maybe condition what you're saying and then you hear your own self and say, oh, okay, I got the answer. The person didn't do anything. It just said and allows you to, to spill your guts to them and by you put it all out there, you can look at the jump and say, oh, wait a minute. Let me take this out right here and this is what I really want and let me go on with that. So basically what they're saying is like when they try to identify electrons and, and, and subatomic, sub, subatomic particles the instruments they use to try to see it impacts the elements, which alters their behavior. So you don't get a pure. Anyway, I don't want to keep going into that. I guess the point that they're saying is that there is an equivalent between the psychic world and the physical world. That's what the point is. Okay. So we can move on. And so there's a direct connection between the physical and the mental. But then also means there's a direct connection between the mental and the physical. So then you can impact your physicalness by your thinking. Then if we take that all the way back to where we started, even in certain situations with the Liberian situation, it's a function of thinking. If you don't go and change the thinking, you're not going to change the situation. You can bring troops in there and separate people and do whatever and do it for 500 years. By the time you remove that, it'll go right back. Because the thinking hasn't changed. Which is what this really is all about. Right. So anyway, so basically we go on talking about psychosomatic medicine, etc. I want to get to the whole issue of uh, it's the next page, page six, in the middle of the paragraph. It says. Uh, it says, when Jung began to investigate the deeper layers of the unconscious psyche, he observed, even before 1930, a form of occurrence which he only much, much later decided to describe systematically as the phenomena of synchronicity. 
This phenomenon consists of a symbolic image constellated in the psychic inner world, a dream, for instance, or a waking vision, or a sudden hunch originating in the unconscious, which coincides in a miraculous manner, not causally or rationally explainable, with an event of similar meaning in the outer world. So, for instance, uh, what? Say, for instance, what do I want to say here in terms of what we're talking about? Oh, I was uh, concerned about having a certain, some, a certain object. I was on my mind. And I walk in a room and an object sitting on the table. Now, that object on the table is not directed, directly uh, there because I thought of it. My thinking of it didn't make it come in that room. But there's a relationship between me thinking about it and then encountering it in the physical world that he calls synchronicity. Because basically what that acts as, it acts as a, uh, I say, reinforcer of the significance of what you were thinking about. In terms of it's something important that you need to understand what it's talking about. Because you're connecting to something more than just, I want to say happen, happenstance or coincidence. It's something significant and the environment is reinforcing the significance of it by you meeting it in the physical world. Now we'll say, oh, ain't that a coincidence? And going about our business. As opposed to saying, well, like, there's something deeper here. I need to look deeper at what this really means. But most of us don't do. And so these things happen all the time in our life. As you become more and more reflective and more and more conscious of your inner life, you will start to meet more and more of these things in the outer world. And they actually start to become like directional, like signs, like uh, directional signs to help you, guide you along your journey in life. Yeah. Can it be what? Can it verify something that's true? Yeah. Right. Right. What Young is trying to do is say, first of all, there is a direct connection between the material world and the psychic world. It's on the on same continuum. So now for something to happen in the psychic world to coincide with a phenomenon in the physical world is saying that there is a match going on. So now that should give you an indication that there's something greater happening here. So what is the significance of this thing? It has greater significance because of this match between the both poles. So then what does it mean? What's the meaning of this? So then the other side of it is for individuals to start understanding symbolism and how what symbolism means. There's a whole, you know, thing you know, symbolism really. There's two books I recommend. I think they're in the, in the list. One is called Symbol and the Symbolic, and the other one is Esotericism and Symbol. <clears throat> because, and I just read what it said, uh, Luby says, uh, Esotericism and Symbolism initiate the reader to the tone, structure, and mentality of ancient Egyptian knowledge, the wellspring of all Western theology and science. Uh, Lubin makes a distinction between two kinds of human intelligence, one cerebral and the other innate. The symbol is a conventional representation of cerebral intelligence. The hieroglyph, on the other hand, is a direct, non-conventional form of writing with a unique ability to transcribe the innate, the intelligence of the heart. So you have the outer and the inner. The intelligence of the heart it's based upon and operates through symbolism. The self and the inner self communicate to your conscious mind through symbols. That is the dialogue or the form of communication from the inner self. Your spiritual self, your soul, 
divine self, Christ self, Buddha self, Haru self, all those things you want to put to it. The key thing is, do you understand the language? So you can decipher what it's telling you. Because the heart or the soul knows. Because the heart or the soul is the part of the universal in you. So it is connected to the universal order of things, past, present, and future. So when you tune into that and listen to that, and listening is a feminine quality because it's being receptive. And understand the, the language, it then becomes your inner guide or the master within. No. Because a symbol can have multiple meanings depending upon the context of the situation. That's why when he was talking about his dream, I have to understand the context of the dream. Oh, that will affect how you interpret what's how you interpret what's coming to you. It won't necessarily uh, the context is the I would say the time space pattern that's going on in your life. You know, at, 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 a, at a different time, like the season, uh, a coat means one thing in the summer and something else in the winter. It's still a coat, but the context changes its meaning. Where a coat in the in the in a desert situation may mean that you are carrying too much cover, or you're trying to, you know, you got too much weight. I'm just speculating. Where a coat in the winter means that you got protection. So, the, but the context of it defines what it means. Where in the West, they try to make the same symbol mean the same thing all the time. So then it distorts the truth. But anyway, I just want to throw that, put that out there. And let me finish up here. But I guess what I'm tuning you into, and we're talking about number, but basically, numbers are symbols of cosmic functions and so numbers play themselves out in many things you know it might be the number of incidents of something uh, the number of dreams you had or the number of times the thing showed up or the number of people that was in that dream or when you you know all that has significance if you understand what it means so it helps you to decipher that anyway I don't want to make the point you have the handout I keep saying that and read it and there's a couple more pieces here. Uh, turn to page nine. And at the top of the page it says, in the final analysis, the idea of a unus mundi, or a, uh, uh, with a common foundation, is founded on the assumption that the multiplicity, and, and keep these key words in mind, because as we start dealing with zero and one, and one to two to three, you're gonna see the same words come up. On the assumption that the multiplicity of the empirical world, the physical world, rests on an underlying unity. And that not two or more fundamentally different worlds exist side by side or are mingled with one another. Rather, everything be divided and different belongs to one and the same world which is not the world of sense, but a postulate whose probability is vouched for by the fact that until now, no one has been able to discover a world in which the known laws of nature are invalid. We're basically saying that when we look at things, they look at things like layers, right? Physical, emotional, mental, spiritual. And actuality is not layers this way, it is dimensions that are intertwined together. And so everything is interpenetrating everything else. The only thing that separates you from one dimension or another is the rate of energy. And for us, the rate of energy is equated with the rate and level of consciousness. Because as you evolve your, your consciousness to higher levels, you vibrate at higher frequencies, which then gives you access to broader dimensions. And so I, what comes to my mind when I talk about when uh, Adam and Eve got kicked out of the Garden of, of Eden, and how then so-called God set up a guard, the seraphim in front with a flaming sword to keep them out of the garden. 
what that represents is a level of consciousness. Not a physical thing with a sword that's going to cut you down. And that to, so then to get back, and because it, it represented that consciousness went into generation and began to multiply and go deeper into matter. Which means then it separated itself from a certain level of consciousness. The only way to get back in is to elevate the consciousness of the understanding equal to the level of consciousness that, that Eden represents, which is spiritual unity, that enables you to get back in. What I was just trying to illustrate, one, is I constantly try to bring those myths out to show what the myth is really talking about, but also what the process is really talking about. We're talking about elevating consciousness, and by elevating consciousness, you have access to different dimensions. So then if there is no separation between the physical universe and the psychic universe, that means you have the capacity to go anywhere in the universe through your mind. So then how did the Dogons understand Sirius B? Did they go within their own states of consciousness? and be able to be there because everything that's outside is also inside because the collective unconscious represents all of evolution the whole evolutionary process from the beginning of creation to now and to the project is all represented within the unconscious mind so it means you have the capacity then to go within your own self and no past present or future only thing that limits us is our level of consciousness because we're vibrating at such a level, we can't access those other channels of those other dimensions. That's why initiates practice bodily disciplines, uh, they, uh, vegetarianism, uh, physical exercises, to constantly refine their physical senses to elevate the sensitivity to higher and higher states of vibration. Because it's all here right now. It's just we can't access it because our vibratory rate is at such a frequency that we can't tune into it. So well, then, this society constantly pollutes the system to keep people in prison, even in terms of because of their diet and, and, and their uh, diet exercise and mental state are different a different level, they couldn't even be, uh, I want to say good wink is what I want to say, uh, controlled. controlled, because they would have an innate response to wrong. Now, a lot of us have an innate response to wrong, but because our ego has been so conditioned to not respond to it, we suppress it. Yes. And does in fact suppression itself many times manifest itself in actual physically or logical manifestations right. such as a stress induced backache? Right. Right. Even forms of cancer. The cancer is cells that become mutated or or operating out of the natural order. But if you constantly operate out of your natural order, then your body is going to respond and start operating out of this natural order. Because in, re in the real world, you're actually fighting against yourself, your real self. So then your body starts to reflect and starts fighting against itself. So the physical symptoms are indication of the consciousness. So you can just look at the diseases that's plaguing us and if you look at it from a metaphysical perspective, you can understand the social condition that's creating these, that the diseases are actually just an effect of. The diseases themselves are messages to the society of how society is out of order. Let me finish up here. Okay, uh, following on here, it says, uh, even the psychic world is rooted in the same universe. Young stresses, however, that there is little or no hope of illuminating this undivided existence except through, uh, what is that? Atonomy, atonomy, atonomy. But we do know for certain that the empirical world of appearances is in some way based on a transcendental background. Basically, the physical is based upon the spiritual. 
it says here, uh, next paragraph, I think you are correct in assuming that synchronicity, though in practice a relatively rare phenomenon, is an all-pervading factor or principle in the universe, i.e. in the unus mundi, the one world. There is no incommensurably incommensurability between so-called matter and so-called <coughs> psyche. Here one gets into deep waters in the moon. At least I myself must confess that I am far from having sounded these abysmal depths. Look at these key words here. In this connection, I always come upon the enigma of the natural number. I have a distinct feeling that number is a key to the mystery, since it is just as much discovered as it is invented. It is quantity as well as as well as meaning. For the latter, I refer to the arithmetical qualities of the fundamental archetype of the so-called self. So they're saying that the so-called self is the monad or the microcosm, and its historically and empirically well-documented variants of the four, three plus the one and the four minus the three, etc. Blah, 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 blah. If we go into the next paragraph, and I'll kind of bring it to a summary here in the next couple of years. Yeah, this is kind of bring it to a summary. Uh, again, he's talking about the I Ching. For those who are not familiar with the I Ching, uh, it's one of the books I will bring in next week. The I Ching represents the Book of Changes. It's, represented, it's based upon 64 hexagrams, and a hexagram is a combination of two trigrams. And it's basically... Uh, and the same system is what they use in uh, East by divination or African divination based on the same principle. And all of it is based upon the combination of male and female or zeros and ones, just like computers, in terms of the binary system. All of creation is a function of the binary system of male and female interacting and creating all kinds of variations. <laughs> but the hexagrams are based upon straight whole line equals they call yang or the male or the plus and the broken line represents yin which is the female which represents negative but not negative in terms of bad negative in terms of polarity and the combination of the two represents a hexagram the first hexagram is this six yang line which represents heaven and creation. Uh, I think the second one is the female, which represents earth and uh, humans and manifestation. Because for creation to, to become real, it has to reflect itself in matter. So anyway, the point I was saying is these, six, these combinations of the male and the female make up 64 hexagrams and those 64 hexagrams are identified as the Book of Changes. And they then were able to uh, codify how all life changes can be defined within these 64 patterns. And there's a whole philosophical system of it. So that's, I'll just kind of give you a brief introduction of the I Ching. Uh, but it's correlated, and we were, see, when we were into sacred geometry, we were talking about the 64 in terms of 8 times 8, I mean 64, and the chessboard, and also the uh, basis for the uh, uh, defining these various geometrical patterns based upon squares and the replication of squares. But well, the issue was the 64. Uh, anyway, it says here, according to uh, Wang Fu Chi's interpretation, also understand that the origin of China